Greetings War Thunderers, this is Longshot, and in this video I'm going to compare the flight characteristics of planes from each nation in the 2.3 to 2.7 battle rating range. And don't worry, I won't be listing out a set of dry and boring statistics, no, I will show you tests and comparisons that are relevant to how these planes are actually used in battle. Now, astute viewers may be wondering, hang on, didn't I already see this video? After all, I did actually release a vid looking at 2.3 rated planes a few days ago. And among the feedback I received on that vid, many people advised me to consider 2.7 BR planes as well as 2.3, and there were many good suggestions for tests that I hadn't thought of, and I also wanted to include more precise information on things like climb rates and energy retention. So, I decided to get straight onto it and make a better version of the vid, which is this and it will hopefully serve as a good reference for players starting out in realistic battles. So, let's look at the planes I've chosen as what I believe to be the best fighters in this BR range from each nation. From Germany, I've gone with the Bf 109 F1 that you see here, and I know a lot of people prefer the E4. Don't worry, I will explain my reasoning later in the video. Uh, Japan was a tough choice between the K-43-2 and the K-61-1 Ko, both of which are excellent fighters in their own ways. I decided on the Hayabusa first, though I could just as easily have gone with the other plane. Uh, Britain was an easy choice, the Spitfire Mark 1A. Uh, yes, there is a 2A in this range, but I've always found that plane to be rather redundant. In fact, I'm ashamed to say that in three years of playing War Thunder, I haven't even spaded it yet. Um, there's also the Tiffy Mark 1A, which is a far better fighter in realistic than it is in arcade, where it's next to useless. Uh, but although the Tiffy has a lot more firepower and is a superior boom and zoomer, the Spit is better in pretty much every other aspect. America was difficult, because, to be honest, none of their planes in this battle rating are particularly good, and there's quite a few to choose from. In the end, I decided on the F4U-1A, as it's simply the best of a bad bunch. Lastly, Russia has the Yak-7B, uh, the Yak-1, the Lag-366, and the MiG-334, and out of these, I went with the Yak-7B. Before I get into it, here's something you might find useful. This shows the indicative air speeds at which you'll get the maximum sustained climb rate for each of these planes, and I've listed it in order from the best climber down to the worst. I measured these using the data the game itself outputs on localhost, which you can see in a browser, and you can see from this table how wildly inaccurate some of the stats cards are. Okay, so let's get started. And I'll begin with a split S and Immelman test to measure energy retention in vertical maneuvers. Now in this test I've taken the plane up to 4000 meters altitude. I'm going to accelerate it until it gets to an indicative airspeed of 360 kilometers an hour. In this case I'm using the Spit 1A and then I'm going to turn it over and go straight into a split S. I'm going to hold full up elevator and then I'm going to pause it and measure exactly what the plane's altitude was and speed was at the bottom of the split S. That shows me how much altitude it's lost and also what this, how much speed it's gained. Then I'm going straight up immediately into an Immelman with WEP and I'll do the same thing. When it levels out there, I'm going to measure the altitude it's recovered so I can see how much it lost in that maneuver and also the speed it's doing now so I can see how much speed it lost compared to the 360 kilometers an hour it started out with. And then if the plane's capable of it, I'm going to try and take it up into a second woman immediately after I correct the roll. And the Spitfire is capable of pulling it off. And by capable, it means it's got to be able to level off and without falling out of the sky in a stall. And as you can see, the Spit does it. Uh, only a couple of other planes uh, managed to do that, the uh, K-43 and the K-61. Let's see how the other planes went. The AX-7B has the best energy retention and acceleration, getting up to the highest speed at the bottom of the split S, and also still the highest speed after the Immelman. Um, it also recovered nearly all of the, uh, the altitude lost, as did the K-43 lower down. Um, the greatest amount of loss of altitude in the split S was the Corsair, and its energy retention wasn't great on the way back up either. Neither was the bf 109 F1s, which only just 210 km h the lowest speed, as it pulled out of the Immelman. So that gives you a bit of an idea of how much energy they bleed in sharp vertical maneuvers. Let's move on to the next test. Okay, in this one I wanted to measure uh, the plane's energy retention through more smooth and high speed kind of maneuvers. And a boom and zoom is an obvious example of that. So again with the plane at 4000 meters and 360 kilometers an hour, I gently lower it into a 40 degree dive. And I wait till it gets down to 2000 meters and pause it there. 
and then I note down what speed it's doing at 2000 meters because that's a fixed point I can measure. And then I very gently, because I don't want to snap off the wings, lift the plane back up again into a climb. And uh, back up to 40 degrees we go. I'll uh, wait until it gets uh, back down to 360 kilometers an hour, which was the speed I started the first dive in, and I'll see how much altitude it has recovered. Note that down. And then let it keep climbing until it gets to the sustained climbing speed, which was in the table I showed you earlier. And I'll note the altitude at which uh, it does that as well. For this uh, Key 43 it is 260 kilometers an hour. And doing this I can compare the planes and see which of them has the better energy retention and recovery out of a boom and zoom, as well as uh, which hits the highest top speed. The Yak-7B, how's it gone? Uh, 710, the Corsair is the fastest out of all the planes in the dive at 720 kilometers an hour. Um, let's look at how much altitude they recovered for 360 kilometers an hour. It's very close. The uh, Yak-7B has it at 3,290, followed closely by the uh, Corsair. Um, and then we look at the altitude they've reached at climbing speed, and the Yak is far and away the best. The Corsair comes in just second. So for pure boom and zoom, uh, the Yak is the best plane here, and the Corsair is close on its heels. The other ones, the Spitfire and, and 109, are kind of mediocre, I guess. The 109 a little bit better than the Spitfire. And you can see that the Key 43 is just not built for this exercise at all. In fact, I was very worried I'd snap the wings in that dive. That's really uh, pushing the plane a bit beyond what it should be uh, taken. OK, in this test I want to measure how long it takes planes to get from a, a low speed of 200 kilometers an hour up to 300, and then up to 350, and finally 400 kilometers an hour. So give me an idea of its short range acceleration and also its acceleration up to a higher speed. Um, obviously, the less time it takes, the more powerful the engine and the less drag the plane has, um, and the better you'll be able to escape situations in a plane like this or run an enemy down. So, first there's Spitfire. Gets to 300 kilometers an hour in 10.6 seconds. Moving on from there to 350, it takes 18 seconds from, from 200 to 350, and from 200 kilometers an hour to 400 kilometers an hour, took it 30 seconds. Let's see how that compares with the other planes. And we can see that the best up to 300 kilometers an hour was the BF 109, uh, followed closely by the Key 43. Mid range, the BF 109 is still superior, but the Yak is starting to come into it. And up to 400, the Yak is now the fastest plane to reach that speed. It must have a lower drag coefficient than the others. BF 109 is still very good. The worst is that uh, poor old Corsair. Um, don't look to American planes for acceleration. They're heavy. Uh, they just don't accelerate well. So if you get low and slow and in trouble in, this, in a, an American plane, chances are you're not going to escape. All right, there are two types of turning in this game. One is a sustained turn, which I'll look at in a minute, where your plane is down to the lowest speed it can manage in a turn because the turning is going on for too long. And the other is when your plane is traveling at high speed and you want to pull off a short and sharp turn, uh, either to follow a target or, or for whatever reason. Um, and these are the kind of turns which can cause G-lock and also rip off wings if you're not careful or if the plane is uh, weaker construction. Uh, so I'm trying to demonstrate this with the Corsair. I want to uh, put it down into a dive. I'll get it up to 600 kilometers an hour. Then I'm going to level off and all the other planes are here for comparison purposes. And then I just pull as hard a turn as I can. I'll let it get to around the halfway point. I'll stop it there and you can see that the Corsair is one of the slower turners here. Uh, about the same as the uh, the Yak-7. Uh, the Spitfire is well ahead. And interestingly, the Key 43 is not doing that well in a high, sharp high-speed turn. It's about the same as the BF-109. Um, and you can also notice with the Spitfire, it is very close to blacking out. In fact, it G-locks shortly afterwards. The other thing I look at at this point, sorry to hold it here for so long, I look at the speed each of the planes are doing, and I'll list that out in the table in a couple of seconds. Moving along, the Spitfire is G-locked. The K43 now G-locks as well. The other planes do not. When we get to the end of the turn, and now the Corsair is the slowest of the turners, the 109 being faster and then the Yak, um, I again notice how, note what the speed is. So I can see exactly how much speed they've lost in that sharp manoeuvre, which I guess is similar in a way to uh, the Immelman and Split S test I performed earlier, but this time it's on a horizontal turn. Now it's worth noticing that none of the planes lost their wings in this turn. I kind of thought that the... Uh, higher booster in the Spitfire might have, but I couldn't get that to happen. So just to show you how the uh, planes went in terms of energy retention, 
Speed at 90 de uh, 180 degrees, firstly. Uh, the XMB is, again, the fastest. It really doesn't seem to bleed energy much at all. It's almost like a, an early Yak-3. Uh, close after it comes the Corsair, and the Key 43 is also holding speed quite well. The other two are dropping it off quite markedly. Um, speed at 360, obviously I can't note it for the Spit and Key 43 because they G-locked, but the others, uh, 380 for each. The Corsair is bleeding speed a lot if you hold it in a turn for too long. Uh, the Yak 7B is, again, retaining it pretty well. Okay, the purpose of this test is to basically measure how fast these planes turn in elevator turns, flat horizontal ones, but once they bled off all their extra speed. So I'm down at 2,000 metres, um, I'm just going to turn the plane as, as much as I need to until the speed is pretty much levelled out, and then I'll measure how long it takes to do a 360 degree circle. Now of course your mileage may vary with these planes based on altitude, as, and that's true for all of the tests I'm doing, I've just chosen an altitude uh, at random here. Uh, but it's hopefully enough to give a bit of a, a ballpark estimate. Okay, the Spitfire has reached 180 degrees around the turn. Uh, the Key 43 is very hot on its heels, they're almost exactly the same. Of the others, the 109 and Yak seem to be pretty similar, and the Corsair is dragging behind. It really isn't that good at turn fighting, that plane. Carrying on until the Spitfire is going to be the first to reach 360 degrees, and you can see the gap it has on the Key 43. Uh, the BF-109 and Yak are still pretty close together, maybe the 109 is slightly ahead. Just watch them. Yet yeah, 109 just passes 360 before the Yak does. And finally the Corsair. So the Yak and Corsair are really not turn fighters. Um, they seem to be much more in the energy fighting boom and zoom type style. But these planes have combat flaps and that changes things, all except the Spitfire which does not. So I'm just showing the first term again for the Spitfire. So now the Key 43 has just reached uh, the 180 point slightly ahead of the Spitfire this time. Nothing much has really changed with the other planes though. They're all sort of in the same kind of uh, order relative to each other. Uh, now the Key 43 has reached 360 before the Spitfire now, so the combat flaps definitely give it an advantage. It can defeat the Spitfire with them and cannot without. The 109 finishes ahead of the Yak, which finishes ahead of the Corsair. Lesson here with the Corsair and Yak, do not take them into turn fights. Uh, most of the time you're not going to come out ahead. And of course I can't measure turning rate without measure the roll rate, which is just as important. Okay, now the Corsair has rolled over 180 degrees. Where are the other planes at? Uh, looking at the Yak, it's rolled a bit further. The Key 43 has rolled quite a bit further. Uh, it's the fastest rolling plane of the ones I've selected here. Of the others, the 109 hasn't quite made 180 degrees, and the Spitfire has barely reached 90 degrees. So it is the slowest by far in terms of roll rate of all the planes. In fact, that is the Spitfire's main weakness, if it has one. It just simply cannot roll very well. Okay, the Corsair has now made a full 360 degree roll. The uh, Hayabusa is well into the next roll, as is the Yak. Um, the BF-109 has only rolled 180 degrees now, and so on and so forth. You get the picture. Another thing I'm looking for in this test is any kind of wobble with the reticle bouncing out of the uh, the mouse aim circle there. If a plane does that too much, it's likely to be unstable in a battle, and I try and avoid such planes. Now, do many people in uh, realistic battles perform rudder turns? And I'm not talking about hammerheads, I'm just talking about using the rudder in, to turn the plane in general. In arcade, it is the key with many planes to, to winning in battle. Uh, I don't know how common it is in realistic, and not all planes can do it. I'm hitting left rudder and I'm going to hit up elevator at the same time, which will make the plane pull to the side and also turn over in that direction. And to prevent it tipping right upside down, I'm going to hit the ailerons in the opposite direction to try and correct against the rudder stalling out the left wing. Let's see how the plane goes. And I'm correcting, and it's holding, so I have complete control of the plane. And what this does in RB far more than it does in arcade, um, the rudder acts as a real air brake. It will slow the plane down tremendously, which can be very useful to force overshoots. Obviously, you've got to know what you're doing. You could get yourself in trouble doing this. And some planes, such as the 109 here, can actually climb in this maneuver in a climbing spiral until the speed drops too far and they lose the ability to keep it going. But the 109 can actually go up a thousand meters in, in a single sustained maneuver like this, as this plane is actually doing, though it is with a few pauses on the way up to regain a bit more speed. And as you can see, I'm just keeping that rudder pressed, the up elevator pressed, and just hitting the roll as needed to maintain the speed, continually watching that speed, and watching the angle of the plane in order to keep the manoeuvre going. 
and the slower the speed is, the less sharply the plane's turning. So let's see how other planes go performing this manoeuvre. Here's the 109E4, and this is one of the reasons I don't particularly um, like this plane in comparison with the F1, and I'll describe the other reasons later. It can't perform the manoeuvre. The um, ailerons are just not strong enough to counter the rudder. Um, now obviously if you had a joystick with pedals, you can you don't have to apply 100% rudder as you do with a, with a keyboard, so you'd be able to control it and do all sorts of extra manoeuvres with the plane that a mouse aim and keyboard player can't do. As you can see, I've almost got control of the manoeuvre, but really the plane isn't doing what I want it to do. Uh, even worse are the Russian planes. I can't get any of them in this battle rating range to perform rudder turns at all. However, some planes are brilliant at it. Uh, the Spitfire is extremely good. It was a bit better than the 109F1 I just showed you. Um, it can easily hold this manoeuvre for a long time and gain a lot of altitude. And by the way, it's not just climb. You could use this in a turning battle uh, if needed, uh, just here and there. Uh, this is the Key 43 Hayabusa, obviously, and it is absolutely um, brilliant at it. The main advantage is this plane can continue the manoeuvre going at far lower speeds than the other planes can manage, because this thing's just made of balsa wood and uh, rice paper. It's so light. Um, it's almost as, as if it's riding the thermals and just flying up there like a kite off its, off its string. The uh, Key 61 can do this as well, uh, about as well as a Spitfire, not quite as good as a Hayabusa. And you can see, um, with planes like this, this could be a real weapon to help you turn the tides and escape from a bad situation and gain an altitude advantage over a slower opponent. Okay, so you've seen how well the planes I chose performed against each other, but how about the alternatives from each nation that I didn't select? Well, let's start with Germany. The F1 has a distinct advantage over the E4 in every area except turn rate, where the E4 is superior by only half a degree or so per second, which is hardly significant. I tend to feel that people prefer the E4 due to its guns, as it does have twice the hitting power. And that's why I'm practicing with the F1 in mission editor battles like this, getting used to sniping as accurately as I can with its one cannon. If the flight performance between those planes was closer, then I'd definitely prefer the Emil, but the Friedrich is just a better plane overall, so I'm going to try and make it work. With Russia, it's clear cut. All the other planes, for instance, failed the boom and zoom test. They all lost their wings before I could pull out of the dive. Apart from the MiG, they lose a lot of performance over 3,500 metres, and the MiG is one of those planes with really unstable rolling, and that really shows when you're trying to get guns on target. It also has poor acceleration. For America, the Corsair is a poor climber, it loses a lot of energy in manoeuvres compared to planes from other nations, plus it's an absolute liability in a dogfight, and its acceleration is terrible. However, it does have decent energy retention if it's handled smoothly, combined with an above-average roll rate. So, if it can get an altitude advantage in a battle, it should make for a decent boom and zoomer. None of the other American planes are nearly as good. They're worse climbers, with poorer energy retention, and they're not great in a dogfight either. Honestly, if you're flying one of the other nations in this battle rating range, and an American plane shoots you down, you only have yourself to blame. And having said that, the last time I flew the Yak-7B, I was actually shot down by a P-40. And look where that ranks on this table. Hmm... OK, moving along, here's my results for Britain. The Tiffy is the better plane in a high-speed turn, as it's less likely to G-lock or lose its wings, though I wasn't able to rip the wings from my Spitfire over numerous tests where I really tried to do so. I'd go I'd G-lock first. In all other categories, the Spitfire is a phenomenal plane, which makes it the easy choice, but let me tell you, America wishes it had as good a plane as the Tiffy at this battle rating. And lastly, here's Japan. And you can see from that table why it was a tough choice between these planes. The Hayabusa is a superb climber and dogfighter, but the Key 61 is a better energy fighter and is able to boom and zoom far more effectively, and the Hayabusa just can't do that. Their only weaknesses are weak firepower and extreme fragility, which both planes share. I'll probably end up taking turns to fly each of them. They both look like a lot of fun. Well, I hope you found the video helpful. I do intend at some point to make one of these for the 3.0 to 3.7 battle rating range, however not straight away. I want to make some gameplay related vids as well as more additions to my beginner's guide series first. And as always, I welcome your comments, I look forward to reading them, and until my next video, good hunting no matter what mode you play, and I will be seeing you in the skies.